Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special. I am Renuka Methal, the editor of Forbes Africa. Today I'm in conversation with a leader who is Ethiopia's very first female president. And she's currently the only serving female head of state in Africa and in October will complete two years in office. She is President Saleh Burke Zude, who joins us from her office in Addis Ababa. So nice to see you, Madam President. Uh, I hope you've been well and staying safe all through this time uh, in Ethiopia. Tell us a little bit about uh, the pandemic uh, situation in your country. Um, I know Ethiopia has not had a lockdown so far, but you have had uh, um, about over a thousand uh, confirmed cases so far with many recoveries. But how are you dealing with, what are your efforts on the ground in curbing this pandemic in Ethiopia? Okay, no, uh, thank you very much and thank you for this opportunity. Um, uh, uh, as you have said, um, we are in the, the third wave, uh, like uh, the whole uh, continent after Asia, uh, uh, Europe, Americas, and now Africa. So, um, as you know, there is no blueprint. We haven't seen one um, that others uh, uh, managed to follow. Um, it has been said time and again that we are fighting an invisible um, uh, enemy. So it's like shooting at a moving um, target. Or we can also say that we are running in a forest in one direction, not knowing which is the right one, and then to have to change course, uh, and, and, and so on. So it's not easy. But the government of Ethiopia has taken swift measures, uh, starting from, in fact, January, when uh, we heard about, about this uh, pandemic. Um, there is a, a ministerial committee uh, which has been set up, which is coordinating all the efforts, the preparedness and response uh, uh, for the COVID. Uh, the government has commissioned a public emergency operation uh, center. Uh, regional and, um, and uh, city health authorities uh, are also uh, has, have activated their uh, emergency operation centers. Um, uh, uh, you may recall that uh, when we had the first cases, um, uh, samples were sent to South Africa uh, to be tested. Now um, uh, we have um, uh, set up laboratories, not only in Addis Ababa, but in our different regions. There was a house-to-house -house check uh, in Addis, and uh, that has also helped, really. Um, we're trying to increase the number of tests. Um, as you have said, we are a little bit over 1,000 now um, uh, with a dozen of uh, Ethiopians who have lost their lives. Um, uh, but uh, I can say that in the, com in the past uh, week or 10 days, the numbers have really, um, it has gone up. Uh, the cases are more than, than before. So, um, the, one of the uh, measures that has been taken and I think was important was to create this quarantine, quarantine um, places uh, to stop uh, any uh, imported, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in cases to, to the country. Uh, but now uh, we have uh, what is very much more complicated. It's the community transmission. Uh, so the contact tracing is... Uh, is uh, going on, um, and uh, this is what we are uh, doing uh, currently. Uh, uh, but uh, much has been also said in terms of, uh, of uh, public awareness uh, campaign, uh, starting from our uh, uh, telecom. Uh, so whenever you dial a number, you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, guidelines and directives uh, given through the forms as well. I would like also to mention uh, the great work done by our uh, health extension workers, 42,000 of them, uh, composed of uh, women, 98% of them are women, in fact. So they are, we have been mobilized to, to create awareness uh, because they can go um, to the lowest administrative level. But, uh, of, 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 of the country. So they have been doing a great job. Um, one day I will, I will have to, 
to talk more about this amazing uh, woman. So uh, currently, this is uh, uh, where we are. We're trying to really contain uh, 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 the spread. Um, Addis has been uh, the most uh, affected. So some areas where uh, it looks like they are the, the kind of the epicenter of this, of the, of the community transmission, are being dealt with. So this is how it looks like. Uh, we maybe I, I, I will uh, elaborate uh, maybe with other questions, but uh, definitely in, in what we were doing, we didn't go to a full lockdown. Um, we didn't. Uh, it, it didn't warrant that uh, that uh, measure uh, because of uh, what we are and how the society is uh, currently. So it will create more problem than uh, it solves. So this is where we are. Madam President, um, Ethiopia is one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. How has this pandemic affected the GDP and the economy? I mean, how, what are your plans to resuscitate the SMME sector in particular? Yes. Um, uh, well, um, it, it has hit uh, some sector. And of course, it's going to, uh, to affect uh, our growth, definitely. Uh, but um, uh, the Ethiopian government has uh, uh, initially, uh, in early May, in March, rather, sorry, um, uh, you know, announced a package to bolster healthcare um, uh, spending. Um, according to the COVID-19 uh, multi-sectoral preparedness and response plan, uh, there was um, there were plans for the emergency uh, food. Um, distribution to individuals vulnerable to food uh, uh, insecurity. Um, also, uh, um, you know, resources uh, which has been put uh, uh, for the health sector response under the worst case scenarios. The provision of um, emergency shelter um, and non-food items. Here in Addis, we have uh, set up uh, food banks uh, to really prepare for any worst case scenarios and to support the most uh, vulnerable. Um, the fund allocated to agricultural uh, sector support, nutrition, uh, the, 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 the protection of uh, vulnerable groups and so on. The National Bank of Ethiopia has also uh, provided um, additional uh, liquidity to private banks to facilitate and debt uh, restructuring and prevent uh, ban bankruptcy. Uh, social safety net will be provided to unemployed individuals. Uh, so these are, in a nutshell, some of the measures that the government has taken. But of course, um, as you have rightly said, as is the case for other countries as well, um, the, the, the impact on the economy will be uh, also uh, very important and we have to address that. Um, having said that, um, let me add on this, we, we, we have uh, said, uh, we have read uh, so many times that uh, this virus doesn't discriminate, it doesn't pick and choose and so on. This is what we have seen uh, up to now, but uh, its impact I wouldn't say pick and choose, but it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. We have seen that uh, those who have been affected, both in, mostly in fact, in the developed world, are those who are more vulnerable. Yeah. So I think we have to also see that, because if we say uh, it, it doesn't discriminate, it wouldn't show the, the real picture when we go to the consequences of the impact of it. One of the uh, if consequences of the COVID-19 pa uh, pandemic in Ethiopia has been that the parliamentary elections that were scheduled to happen in August has been postponed indefinitely. And surely uh, this is also now a time for countries to set aside their regional tensions and issues. And the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has said that if the virus is not defeated in Africa, it will bounce back to the rest of the world. 
Tell us now, President, I mean, now is the time for more global stakeholders to come together, more global collaboration. How do you think Africa can deal with this uh, crisis of this ma magnitude? Yes, I mean, um, <laughs> we, we are in a terrible crisis globally, uh, but we cannot stop everything and on, only concentrate on one thing when we know that the rest will affect us in big ways as well. But there are things we cannot do uh, if we have to really contain and, and, and uh, defeat this uh, virus. The uh, Prime Minister, as you have rightly said, uh, has uh, clearly spelled out that uh, if not defeated in Africa, then it will bounce back to the rest of the world. I think it's a call for global leadership and global solidarity. It's a reminder, if you have forgotten, that uh, we are in, in this, you know, together. Uh, so this is uh, wh what uh, the, the Prime Minister wanted to underline. Because I, I have seen many uh, things happening in, in, in this world. And um, we have had, uh, you know, global issues, global threats to, 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 to humanity, to peace and security in, in the world. But our response have, has lacked, you know, um, collaboration, cooperation, and solidarity. The first instinct being, if it's not affecting me in a big way, then it's OK. Yeah. But this virus, if there is something important that it has shown, that we cannot remain um, in, 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 in our borders, in our, uh, um, you know, uh, countries alone. Um, because we need a collective action to combat a collective threat. So uh, this is uh, what we, we, we should be really looking at. So we really need to be uh, vigilant, to be, to know, what we should be uh, uh, doing together. Because there cannot be a victory over uh, the virus in one or some countries alone. Uh, we will have to contribute regardless of our, um, of our size, of our economies, of the size of, of our economies, or our populations. This is what I have said along with other leaders uh, uh, in one of the op-ed that uh, the president of Germany uh, proposed. Uh, so um, I, I think we have to realize and uh, not to be, um, not to forget too soon when you see that uh, things are getting better or the curve is going down, that uh, we can survive. Uh, long. The Prime Minister brought this op-ed, if I do recall well, like two months ago. Um, but <clears throat> in the meantime, we have also heard the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, really expressing um, his frustration over the lack of, of, of solidarity, of uh, collaboration, of, of cooperation. So I think we have to remind the world time and again that we are interdependent, that uh, there cannot be uh, a victory that we can, um, you know, enjoy uh, alone. So this is basically the call that has been made and in Africa will have to continue. Madam yes. President, you've had a long, illustrious uh, <laughs> career as a United Nations diplomat. And since you're completing, almost completing two years in office as Ethiopia's uh, first female president, you've always been vocal about gender parity. Half of the ministerial cabinet in Ethiopia is women. And you earlier referred to also the role of women on the front line. I mean, how do you think uh, this pandemic will further emphasize the role of women, uh, you know, fighting it and in every sphere? Um, you mentioned the women working in the communities as well. And again, I must ask you, I mean, what is it, how do we unleash the power of the communities at this point? Yeah. You know, women are at the front lines. And I'm really happy that you are mentioning this. 
because there are women that we see and there are so many of them that we don't see the invisible but who keep our system continue um, and since we're talking about the virus and 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 the health uh, you know uh, problem that it is a health threat that it is uh, when you look at uh, at where um, patients are treated and and so on you know the bulk of of them the bulk of those who make this uh, these uh, places, uh, you know, um, suitable for this kind of of, uh, of treatment are women. Cleaners are women. Nurses are all of them women, uh, and so on and so forth. So, I think it's important to acknowledge. And if there is something that uh, this virus has done, is to uh, bring to the fore uh, the role of women, and it would shed light. On, on, on what uh, they are doing on the front lines. But at the same time, it has put the inequalities and, and, and the status of women to the fore. And it shows that there is a lot that we should be doing. Not only should we be doing, it shows that we are on a slippery road and that we can go back, backwards on that. So I, I think it's, it, it it's very important that uh, uh, this issue uh, be also put at the center of, of what we do, because we really need uh, half of, of humanity in, 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 in whatever we do. So it has, it has revealed um, things that we already knew, but uh, uh, we, could, we didn't address properly that the gender issue has to be handled uh, uh, properly, you know, with, with this virus, uh, I, I see that um, uh, women uh, uh, led, you know, the traditional sectors where we find many women are the hardest hit. In Ethiopia, this is what we see in the hospitality mm. area, in health, in education, and and so on. Talking of education, if you allow me. Yes, of course. Mother. You're the chair of the International Commission on the Futures of Education, convened by. Uh, the UNESCO at last year's United Nations General Assembly. So I'd love to hear your views on reimagining education at this point. Yes, I, I, I would like to, to, to talk about that, you know, um, because um, it's, it's, um, it's something very important. If we cannot uh, uh, address these issues, we, we can't go far. On education, this commission that you are referring to has been set up last September uh, on the margins of the UNGA. But it was to think about education in 2050, the futures, you know, uh, to come. Nobody imagined that this issue would be at the core of what we should be doing now when we finish with the, with, 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 the, with the virus. Not only when we finish, as we are addressing the, yeah. the, the, the virus. Because it has clearly shown that the education that we have been, uh, you know, having uh, um, up to now didn't meet the requirement of what we need in our respective countries. So it has to be reviewed, the system, the curriculum, and so on and so forth. This is what we, but now schools are closed. By the way, I heard an interview of, of, of some officials saying, you know, the schools are closed, our kids are back home, they are home, they stay home. So, and they are now busy uh, with, um, you know, the distance learning. I said, wait a minute, ours are not busy with distance learning. 90% of them do not have access to that luxury. Internet. So they are just out of school, period. They are, um, uh, you know, um, they have nothing else to do. And then what happens? School has been a shelter for many girls, not to be, not to, you know, given to, to, to somebody older than them, uh, early marriage, early pregnancies, domestic works, and so on. Here in Ethiopia, in one region alone, I saw that 500 um, girls, were, uh, you know, um, 
buried. Mm -hmm. And um, 1,000 were aborted because uh, women, the CSOs and so on dealing with this, uh, managed to, to intervene on time. So school is with, where we acquire knowledge. School for girls is a shelter. School has been um, and one meal a day that a kid would get that they, they cannot now. So it's a burden on the families back home. So at the commission, at the International Commission for the Futures of Education, we have reviewed the way we, we, we do business and we have come to some nine ideas which are going to be um, at, uh, I mean, known uh, public uh, very soon on how to deal with this and how to deal with the pandemic um, and how to adjust education according to that. Because we hear uh, that, uh, you know, maybe the future is long distance or uh, distance learning and so on and so forth. But we know what the role that school plays, teacher plays, and how we can shape a good uh, citizen when they are at school. So I think it's a good um, uh, it's a good opportunity for us to to review all that education. Uh, Madam President, moving from education to aviation, uh, Ethiopia was among the few airports in Africa that did not shut down its airport. So, and Ethiopian Airlines, uh, one of Africa's fastest growing airlines, it's continued its operations primarily to transfer. PPE and equi other equipment and other test kits and the, the, the Jack Ma when the Jack Ma Foundation delivered the equipment, Ethiopia was the one delivering uh, uh, delivering the supplies. So how's the airline weathering the storm at this point? I mean, were there any job losses? What are your plans uh, for the for the airline? Yes, um, I mean, I, I don't have to talk to describe what Ethiopian Air, uh, Airlines is all about. Uh, from its inception, it's a company that has really tried to, to connect Africa, uh, Af African countries uh, within themselves and connect up Africa with the rest of the world. Uh, uh, Ethiopian allies um, has been uh, clever enough to really repurpose its, um, its uh, fleet. Uh, so now, as you have uh, rightly mentioned, they have uh, uh, transport, uh, to literally every African country, um, the medical supplies uh, that uh, the Jack Ma Foundation has given to Africa under the initiative of, of our Prime Minister um, and with the support of uh, WHO and WFP uh, to all African countries. This has been very critical to start testing to protect, uh, you know, uh, medical workers and so on. So um, this is an airline that was uh, flying like uh, to 74 uh, countries globally. So the cargo is now working. Um, uh, now WFP has made a Salva its air hub in terms of distributing uh, critical supplies to African countries. So we are also working on that. Uh, so passenger um, airplanes have been converted to, to really uh, airlift uh, critical cargoes. And um, that seems to be working. And um, in fact, it's exploring other um, parts of the world where uh, it has not been flying up, up to now. It has also played a critical role in the repatriation of the nationals of some uh, countries uh, in the world. So this is what uh, uh, it has been doing. And uh, up to now, there was no um, Ethiopian airline staff that has been affected or any other measure that has been taken to you know, uh, reduce its, um, its, its staff. So this is what um, Ethiopian uh, has been doing now. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, there are many um, cargo flights, uh, uh, you know, that uh, are being operated by Ethiopian Airlines.
Madam President, um, uh, what are the every crisis brings its own opportunities, and you know it's all about creative destruction in the end, as Joseph Schumpeter, Sch the economist, uh, the famous economist, has said. So, in in Ethiopia's case, what are the in innovations coming out of uh, Ethiopia at this point? What are the new opportunities that this crisis is presenting? You you have raised a very good question, but uh, if you allow me. Uh, it's, it will apply to Ethiopia, but also to the rest of the continent. You have um, quoted an, a well-known uh, person, but somebody also said that necessity was the mother of invention, I think. So we're, 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 I don't know who said it, but I think uh, that's really true. Uh, so um, in, in this kind of a crisis, and we have not seen a crisis such as this one, I think it's a good opportunity to see how we can change things. We, we should innovate and we are innovating. First of all, we have to stop this cut and paste and try to adopt everything that might not fit to, to, to the reality of our countries. Uh, we, we, we really need to, to adapt, to go away from the one size fits all, to take time to think of what we could do which will be relevant to our uh, given realities. And remedy cannot come from far away when you know your symptoms, when you know your disease, and, um, and prescriptions should be based on what you tell them what your problem is all about. I think it's a good opportunity if this virus could accelerate change. And I really hope it, it, it would. So we have to address our vulnerabilities in Africa. I, I think it's a good opportunity for me to mention what the Africa uh, CDC has done in bringing really all of us together to give guidance and, and to see how we can cope with this you know, virus to contain and, and so on. I, I think it's a good, it's a good example. So uh, mine is just to say that we have to think, we have to ask, this question you know, to ourselves. How far are we ready to rethink the models that we have? How far can we be bold in saying this has to change if when we wake up from this nightmare, and I'm sure we will, mm -hmm. the world will be different, but not only different, will be better than what we have today. Because every single day we see that this world is in, you know, unjust and inequal. So um, this is what I, I, I would like to, to say. I'm sorry if I have generalized outside Ethiopia, but... Uh... Thank you so much, uh, Madam President. I'm afraid that's all we have uh, time for now. Uh, I was talking to Ethiopia's President uh, Saleh Vark Zude. This is Renuka Mithil signing off in Johannesburg. And this, thank you for watching this CNBC Africa special.